Good morning, Cornerstone. Let's get started. Hymn number 116. First, second, and last stanza, please. 116. There's a holy and beautiful city whose builder and ruler is God. John saw it descending from heaven when Padmas in exile he trod. Its high massive walls is of jasper. The city itself is pure gold. And when my fountain here is folded, mine eyes shall his glory behold. In that bright city, holy white city, I have a mansion. Forgotten, no tempter is there to annoy, no parting words ever are spoken, there's nothing to hurt or destroy in that bright city. friends too are passing away, and soon I shall join their bright number, and dwell in eternity's day. They're safe now in glory with Jesus, their trials and battles are past, they overcome sin and the tempter. I pray that you are, if you're a child of God, you're watching and waiting and longing for that city to come down. Amen? Welcome to our service this morning. I want to welcome all of our guests, our visitors. Uh, uh, our family decided to take up the whole side just about it over here, and that's great. Uh, my parents came up from Florida. My two uncles uh, came up from Arkansas. And if you haven't uh, had a chance to meet with them, uh, please do so. We end our daughter and her husband are there as well uh but welcome to all of you today um let's see um i was gonna say it's a wonderful yesterday we had actually five generations uh all together at uh at our uh great granddaughter's uh birthday party so five generations together so it's great to have everyone up here uh let's see in the way of announcements um Next uh, Sunday, uh, Sharon and I will be out of town. Uh, Brother Ron's going to be taking care of the uh, service uh, 
Sunday morning and uh, in the afternoon service, Bill John's going to take care of the afternoon service. So I encourage you to be here to support them uh, as we're out and uh, we'll be leaving Thursday and be back on uh, probably Tuesday late. So uh, just letting you know, we'll, we'll be out of town. Uh, we have one other um, announcement by our camp gatekeeper. How many days? How many? 51 days. Okay, so 51 days uh, till camp. If you are planning on going to camp or you think you might like to go to camp, uh, again, it's not just for our youth, it's for our adults as well. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back. If your name isn't there, feel free to write it in. Uh, where can you go for three meals a day for $65 plus a bed? So, I mean, you can't go to a hotel for even a third of that. <laughs> so, or, you know, three times the cost of it, I should say. But uh, it's a great week. It's a great time of um, uh, getting together and, uh, with our sister churches and with our youth and, and just uh, camaraderie. So, again, I encourage you, if you've never been, to consider going. Uh, we leave on Sunday afternoon and come back on Friday. So that's the week of July the 11th, and we'll leave on the 10th. All right, those are the announcements. Uh, prayer requests, prayers of Thanksgiving that you'd like to share. I'm not sure if the Hipskins, I think I said that right, if they're out of town. I know that Austin was supposed to be coming in, so remember Jason and uh, Melissa, in case you weren't familiar with their last name. But they were supposed to be... Uh, I think Austin was coming in from school, I heard. Nicole, you had your hand up. Yes, please continue to pray for my mom as she battles this cancer. And um, she, the update on her is that she has COVID, so they can't do the second treatment of chemo until after the 10 days before they are up and they can do her blood test to make sure it's okay to go ahead with the second treatment. Okay, remember this? Yes, Mary. My cousin uh, passed away on Thursday. She's been very sick, so it's a, a sad time, especially for a daughter and a granddaughter. So I'm asking for prayer for them, but uh, it's a blessing. It's just a so much. So uh, it's been a time. And how's Kelly doing? Kelly is doing better. Doing better? Okay. Remember him though in prayer as well. Alara. Um, I cannot be thankful that I'm feeling good. And I have not been able to see this. And I have not been before. And I didn't get to the test. And I have not been able to see this. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, my daughter will have a friend of mine. And they're preparing her tomorrow. And the mother and her aunt. Okay, remember this? Diane? So my brother is still in the hospital. Um, they're still running a bunch of tests. They're, um, they don't know what's going on with him. But he still has um, cancer going to feed them. They don't know if there's something they can't see in the They don't know what the problem is. Okay, remember it. Stephen, anyone else this morning? Prayer request for prayers of Thanksgiving. My parents will be driving or flying back uh, Tuesday, and uh, uncles Carl and Quinneth will be heading back tomorrow, right? Heading back to Arkansas. So keep them in prayer as they travel. Anyone else this morning? Well, if not, let's open in prayer, and then we'll continue singing and get into the Word of God here in a moment. Brother Ron, would you lead us in our opening prayer? Pray, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your gracious Lord. Thank you so much for the freedoms that we have in this country. us uh, the abilities to carry out your kingdom business. We pray, Lord, that you be with these prayer requests that we need to you. Nicole's mom, uh, Diane's brother, just all these prayer requests, Lord, you know each and every one needs of each and every one. But especially on our hearts, Lord, those that we witness to that are lost, that don't know you, that they might come to know you before it's everlasting too late. Help us, Lord, to uh, speak your word be the, the seed planters that you have designed us to be. And help us to not lose our first love, which is the love that you had for us that we should show to this lost and dying world. We 
ask that you be with us as we lift up our voices in song. We ask that you be with our pastors and bring your preaching up this morning. We want him uh, to be called with everything he has studied, that your word is presented so that it touches each and every one of our hearts. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Let's turn to him number 118, please. 118. <clears throat> Let's turn to him number 115. I ask that you stand on the last stand and remain standing for prayer and receive the morning offering. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. Of my son, angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. My Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Feel His goodness, trust in His love. This is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Brother John, will you come to see the morning offering, please?
Let's all bow our heads, please. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, as we approach that throne of grace, we're thankful to be amongst the land of the living this day. We are truly thankful for all the blessings you've bestowed up on each and every one of us, for the traveling mercies you've granted, and for all the other things, dear Lord. But we come this morning especially praying for those who are lost and on the road to hell, that they would come to a saving knowledge before it's everlasting too late. We know, dear Lord, that we live in a world today that people are so far away from Jesus, and we pray, dear God, that our nation would once again look to thee for guidance and direction. Be with our pastors, he prepares to speak in a few minutes, giving power from on high. From Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Nikki and I are going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I you to get your Bibles this morning, if you will, open the book of Joshua, chapter 7. Joshua, chapter, actually, we're going to go to chapter 6 first. <clears throat> then we'll get into chapter 7 and 8. We're going to be talking about the two battles of Ai this morning and the difference with the two battles, what happened, and the results of each. So in chapter 6 of Joshua, starting in verse 1, it says, and this is where they had prepared to go against the uh, city of Jericho. It says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, and none came in. And it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall encompass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, 
Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and come past the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. Let's drop down to verse 17 of chapter 6. And the city shall be accursed. Now what he was saying was that anything that's in the city will be accursed. You're not to take of it. And all that are therein to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live. And the reason she shall live is because she helped the spies. And she and all that are, in, are with her in, her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. Verse 18 says, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Now if you will turn to verse or chapter 7. Chapter 7 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So they went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai, and the men of Ai smote of them about thirty-six, thirty and six men, for they chased them from the, before the gate even unto uh, Shabriam, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. May we again pray. Father in heaven, as we again approach thy throne of grace this morning, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and for what it continues to teach us about who you are, about trusting you, about seeking your guidance and your uh, and a, having a great relationship with you. But it can only come through knowing you as our personal Savior. And our prayer today if there's one who, here who has never trusted in your son, Jesus, as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll guide and direct my words, for it is in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. So again, this morning we're going to be reviewing the, uh, actually, two battles of Ai. And in doing so, we'll see the failure of, the, of uh, a battle when we, and I believe it's because of this, when we choose to ignore the Lord's guidance and His leadership, and we seek to have success of a battle of our own, of our own abilities. But if we turn and seek the Lord, seek His guidance, seek His, uh, His overwatch. I know that's a military term. Seek His overwatch in the battles that we have. Then we can have success. You know, our our battles come in many different ways and forms. There's a battle for the individual now. It can manifest itself through Satan's temptations. And I will tell you that every one of us are tempted by Satan on a day, day in a day out basis. You say, well, in what manner? Well, let's, let's just name a few. Lust, greed, sensual pleasure in an ungodly sense, unconfessed sin. These are just to name a couple of how that we are all have, we're all impacted on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, there's also the battle of the New Testament assembly or the church. And it can manifest itself also through Satan's temptations. Think about this, the church having self-guidance, self-reliance. Remember what the Lord told the church of Laodicea there in the book of Revelation? He says, have you ever looked at yourself? You think you're rich, you think you have everything you need, but he says you're really poor and dirty and naked and, and you have nothing. But the point is, is that a church can get self-guidance, have self-reliance. We can break our covenant relationship with the Lord and His Word. We were talking about that in Sunday school this morning. The church of Ephesus lost her first love. We can actually reject God's Word. We can replace it with our own. You said, really? Reject it even though we study out, out of it? Yes. We can shoehorn in something that it doesn't say. We can turn a blind eye when there is sin in our camp. And we're going to talk about some this morning as we just read about Achan. 
Achan did, you know, he took of the accursed items. And so we can, we can turn a blind eye to sin. And you want to study about a church that turned a blind eye to sin? Study the church of Corinth. How that there was a man that was having an accessional affair with his, his stepmother. And what did the Lord do? He called him out on it because of that. So a church can turn a blind eye. And so either as a congregation or individually, these are the battles, the types of battles that we all face throughout our lives. And whether we're an assembly, whether we're an individual, I will tell you this, that the Lord has told us that we're supposed to go, especially as a child of God, we're to go forward in our service unto Him, but it is going to be hindered. Our battle will be hindered. Our, the things that we are, are doing for the Lord is going to be hindered if we allow Satan to tempt us and lead us away. If we allow ourselves, you know, sometimes we're our worst enemy. If we allow ourselves to lead us out of the path. But I will tell you this, the Lord seeks our success. The Lord seeks our victory in every battle that we're confronted with. Now, Satan, on the other hand, Satan seeks our defeat. Satan seeks our retreat. And our retreat, our, our defeat, is something that he is pursuing us in to do what? Walk away from the Lord. You know, the, the, Satan does not have to worry about people that are lost. Do you understand this? Now, he'll want to keep them lost, but he really doesn't have to worry about lost people because why because they're already his and you say well how is that well remember what jesus told the jews that were that said they were believers he says you're not a believer he says if you really were a believer you would you would know who i am you would believe in the words of of what i speak he says your father's the devil He's a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar from the beginning. And you are just like him. So if he can keep a lost person in that state of being lost, meaning separated from God, then he doesn't have to do any work. In fact, a Satan is in the blessing business. He can bless a lost man. And a lost man can walk and, and think that he's got everything and everything. And, you know, he's a, the man to be all and end all. Well, I'll tell you, it didn't end very well for that rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, who thought that his belief in God would do what? Get him accepted of God. And how could God turn me away when he's blessed me with all of my riches? Well, it was really, I look at it, it was Satan was really doing a lot of the blessing. And or this, there's a lot of people that out of their own abilities, the, what they've trained in, their knowledge, that they can become very successful in society. But you see who's adding the blessings? They are. And the individual, the rich man died, and what ended up happening to him is that he lifted up his eyes in torment. It wasn't because he was, uh, say, a bad man. Uh, I believe he was probably a good man by our standards, our societal standards. He didn't harm people. He probably helped a lot of people. But you see, that did not make him accepted before God. And as a result, he's spending his entire eternity in hell as a result of it. So you see, Satan gets a lost individual where he wants him and tries to keep him. But now we who are children of God, now that's a different story. Because he's going to come at us hard. Because he wants us to turn away from the Lord. He doesn't want us to witness. He doesn't want us to, uh, to be the, the person that God would have us to be. In fact, we read in, in uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, the, uh, Paul is writing there. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But I will tell you, you can do very little through your own strength. You can do all the things that the Lord would have us to do through His strength. And we know in that Romans 8 and 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them uh, who are what? Are the called according to His purpose. So even though that we have hard times at times, and every one of us have gone through hard times and will go through hard times in the future, is that the Lord still says all of this is to do what? To teach us how to walk forward and go forward in the Lord through His strength. And so we look at this, we're going to look today in this, at these battles, two battles at AI. We already started talking about the first one is that where they came up against AI. Now I want to backtrack just a little bit about former battles that Israel had won. In fact, let's go back to chapter 4 in Joshua. In chapter 4, and if we start looking at verse 19, it says this, Chapter 419 says, And the people came up 
uh, out of Jordan uh, on the 10th day of the first uh, month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jordan. Now, when they came across, they came across that river Jordan, what had happened? They had already had victories in battle on, the other, on that side of Jordan already. And so they, they took, they were instructed to take uh, 12 uh, stones, one that represented every tribe, and those stones which they took, verse 20, out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry uh, land, for the Lord your God dried up the rivers of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord, and look at this, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea 40 years earlier. So the Lord had, had uh, they were, you know, the Israelites, they had been in Israel, they had been enslaved, uh, especially in the latter years of Israel. They, I mean, uh, uh, they're in Egypt, they had been enslaved, they were put under harsh labor, but the Lord sent Moses to bring them out. That's what the Exodus is, to bring them out. And they went through the Red Sea. They had the Egyptian army bearing down on their backs. And he brought them across on the Red Sea, across the Red Sea. He had opened it up. They walked through on dry ground. And then when the Egyptian army came in uh, through that Red Sea, is that when the people had gotten out, the Israelites, and what happened is that they, the uh, army went in and the waters were let back down by God. And all those Egyptian army passed. They died in the Red Sea. So that was one of the really the first victories we see. And he says, after they had gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that you might fear the Lord your God forever. And I will tell you this. I will, in fact, let's read verse 1 of chapter 5. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan. Not only had they had knowledge of 40 years earlier about drying up uh, the, uh, the Red Sea and all that had happened, it says that they, the waters of uh, Jordan were, were uh, dried up so the children of Israel could walk past. They passed over. That their heart, meaning all of these enemies, their heart melted, and neither were their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. And it wasn't just because of the children of Israel. Is that the children of Israel represented God. And what I meant by that is that they represented the power of God. And so all of these people were very, uh, you know, all of these people that would be enemies of Israel, they were very worried that they were coming in, that these people were coming in to take over. They knew what happened there at, at uh, Sion and Og and what had happened on the other side of, of uh, Jordan when, when uh, Moses was leading the people. And they, how they, you know, they, all they want to do is pass through the land. And what did they do? They wouldn't let them do it, and they, they were soundly and resoundly defeated. And so when we look at how that now the Lord has brought, just brought the Israelites across the River Jordan, Everyone that was above age of 20, they had journeyed in that wilderness for 40 years, and they died. So now this is a new crop of people. This is a, a, a new group. Some of, the, some of these people had been born in the wilderness in that 40 years. And so now what is being told, you know, the only two that came out of this, out of that 40-year wilderness journey, was Joshua and Caleb. So they are the leaders. They're going into this across uh, Jordan into this new area. But just as it was told to Moses, he says, I want you to go forward. They have the same marching orders to go forward. And the enemies of the land. Now, where, what about this land? Why were they going forward into this land? Because this land was promised to Abraham. This will be your land. And he had shown him the land. Now, Abraham had never had the opportunity to possess it. But now his children, his grandchildren, and all of those that were after him. Now, we've, we've rolled forward some 470, almost 500 years they've rolled forward. And now they're actually going to be able to take the land that God has given them. But one of the things that we find is that they weren't prepared to take the land. They were actually a reproach unto the Lord at this moment. Because look in, in chapter uh, 6. In chapter, uh, actually, um, let me look at the text here. Chapter, my page just turned. Uh, actually, back in chapter 5. 
So what we find here is that in chapter 5, they had to be readied. They had to be, a reproach had to be taken away. He said, what reproach was before the Lord? I thought he just brought them across Jordan. Well, verse 2 says, And at that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the male men of war, died in the wilderness by the way and after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, meaning coming out of Egypt. But all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So we know that that circumcision that was given, commanded by to Abraham by God was what? It was a token. It was a sign of the covenant that God had uh, given unto Abraham. And, and so everyone in Abraham's family, his, the, all the males, they were to be circumcised. And that had been passed down from generation to generation. However, those that were born in the wilderness, they had not been circumcised yet. So before you can go and before you can uh, show that you are actually the, uh, understand this covenant that I have and I've given your father Abraham, this is what you're going to need to do. So they were circumcised. And then they had to heal up and get ready to go to battle. There were some 40,000 men, if you read in the text, there were some 40,000 that were getting ready to come into Jericho. Now, when they came into towards Jericho, is that they were told, as we just read, that the Lord gave them specific instructions. In fact, when you uh, read the text there in uh, at the end of uh, chapter 5, getting into chapter 6, they were told to do this, something very strange. Take all your men of war, and I want you to put some in the front. I want the Ark of the Covenant here. I want the priests to come in the rearward. And what was going to happen? They were to march around this city one time a day. You might, there was trumpets and blowing, but that was it. You are not to say a word. You're not to unsheathe your sword. You are just to march. Every morning they got up. Day one, marched around, went back to their camp. Day two, Marched around, same thing. Returned to the camp. Now I will tell you, the people in Jericho, you have to be wondering about what they were thinking. When are they going to attack? Because I will tell you, in fact, if you go back and you read their, uh, the account that when the messengers, the spies were sent into, uh, by, uh, by Joshua to Jericho, what ended up happening? What did she tell them? She says, we all faint to heart because we know who you are. We know about your God. Now, you see, they lived in a very pluralistic society. And what I mean by that, they had polytheism. You said, well, what's polytheism? They worshiped many gods. They did. They worshiped many gods. And, and they just looked at uh, uh, this God of Israel just being another God. They didn't look at him being the only true God. The only true God. And I will tell you, in fact, we were studying, uh, or in fact, we were studying there uh, on Wednesday night about the tabernacle. I think it was a tabernacle. When they brought... Uh, when the Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant. And what did they do? They thought that that was a God. And I will tell you why they thought it was a God. It's because Israel acted like it was a God. It wasn't a God. It was a box. It had the Word of God in it, but it wasn't God. God is a, is a spirit. You can't see Him. You know Him. You know of His presence. We've, we learn about Him through His Word. We study to know about Him. But he's a, He is some, not something, in fact, He said... In the commandments he had given to Moses, he says, Thou shalt not make any graven images unto me. Don't even try to make any facsimile of anything that represents me. Because I will tell you, you will make it your God. Look at that, I fashioned it. He says, no, I fashioned you. In fact, I believe the Bible tells me that it was God, not you, not me, that was able to go and take a little bit of dirt out of the creation that he made called the earth, he was able to then form it. And by the way, men, we're made of dirt. We are. The Bible says we're made of dirt. He took the dirt. He formed us out of the dirt. And then he breathed in life unto us. And we became a living soul. He didn't do it to any animal. He didn't do it to any plant. He did it to us. And so what we find is that man was made different, but yet... 
Even during the days of the Philistines and even during the days here of these battles that they had and they dealt with, is that all these different places, all these different people, all these different cities, they made their own idols. But you know, he says, what he says in his word, think about the idols you make, is that you have to take and you have to fashion them yourself. You have to put them on a stand. They have no ears to hear, no eyes to see, no mouth to taste. And yet when they need to go somewhere, you have to pick them up. And he says, if you're worshiping that, then you're just as dead as them. But you see, Israel had a living God. Israel was to be the mouthpiece for God. In fact, the scripture in the New Testament tells us that Israel was the, or the church of the wilderness. They were to talk about who God is, the true living God. And it wasn't the Ark of the Covenant. He lives he reigns. We're to listen to him. We're to seek his direction. We're to seek his guidance. We're to listen to his instruction. We're to heed his instruction and to follow his instruction. Now let's get back to what we're doing here around Jericho. You might have thought I lost my tra train of thought. It did not. Now, day one, they went around. Do not say a word. Day two, go around. Day three, go around. And so on. Day six, one time around. But then they were told, on the seventh day, we will encompass this city seven times. You do not say a word. You do not speak. But when you hear the trumpets, when you hear the trumpets, in fact, go back to chapter 6. In chapter 6, he said here that in verse 10, And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. And so as a result, that seven times, that, seven, that seventh day, they circled it the first time, and I'm sure that uh, Jericho, they thought they're going back home. Round two came that same day. Uh-oh, now what? That's different. Round three, they circled. That's different even more. What's going to happen? They get up to six. I don't know what's going to happen. And now we get to seven. And when they get to seven, <clears throat> now there was the shout. Look at verse 16. In fact, verse 15 of chapter 6. It says, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets. Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And they were and so as a result, that's the you know what was going to happen. And we know that from scripture it says, and the walls fell down. Now, you have to think about this when it says fell down, fall, uh, they fell down. Oftentimes we think of falling down as that something's like this is uh, standing up in a perpendicular manner and it falls down. Well, you got to think about this. Who was on top of one of those walls? Rahab. And the Lord says that Rahab is not to be harmed, no, anybody's in her house. So then that starts to ask and beg another question. Well, did only a section not fall down? Or did it do one or two things? <clears throat> did it just crumble and fall down? Or did it actually just sink into the ground? Like an elevator would. Now, that wall is down. As the Lord said, that wall is down. And there's some evidence that it actually went down by archaeological digs. The point is, the Lord says, I'm going to give you the victory. But there's a requirement again. Verse 17 of chapter 6 gave that warning. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. To the Lord only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are uh, with her in the house, because she hid the messengers uh, that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing. So meaning... Anything that's in this land, I don't care what it is, clothing, uh, animals, I don't care what it is, it's accursed. Do not take of it. Do not take of it. Leave it alone. Burn it up. Get rid of it. But there was also another statement <clears throat> that's in verse 19. Yeah. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron 
are consecrated unto the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the, of the uh, Lord. Now, why? <clears throat> why is that there? This was going to be the major first battle that this group of people is going to encounter. And the Lord requires the first fruit of our lives. The Lord required, was going to require the first fruits of this battle. All of the treasure, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, all of that would be considered the first fruit of the spoil. And all of that was, was going to be coming to treasure of the Lord. We'll see in a moment that they were allowed to take other stuff later on. But the first fruit belonged to the Lord. Now, again, this battle. The battle was the Lord brought the wall down. They went in. And look at verse 1 of chapter 7. It says, But the children of Israel had committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerai of the tribe of Judah, did what? He took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from, uh, men from Jericho. Now, he had committed this sin, and yet Joshua wasn't aware of what had happened. Wasn't aware of what had happened. And so the men of this army of Israelites says, you know, we went and spied it out. We looked at it. There's not very many people there. There's not, you know, there's maybe 10,000. We, we don't need very many. And think about this. We had just had, we just had all these other victories. Jericho had just been annihilated. In fact, they, you know, they were told is that this is an accursed place. And Joshua had, if you go and read the text, Joshua had proclaimed this, that anyone that tries to build Anyone that tries to build back Jericho is going to do so through the death of his own firstborn. And if you go and study that later on in the, in the Kings, you'll find that there was with Ahab, there was a man by the name of uh, Hiel, I think it was, is that he had started to build back Jericho, and he did so in his first son. In other words, his first son died just as Joshua had proclaimed that this was accursed. So when you look at, at what's going on here, is that the men came to Joshua and said, you know what, we can take Ai. They, there's not that many there. We, we believe, and what they were really doing was saying, you know what, we really don't need God in this. And how many times do we face a battle and say, you know, I can handle this. I can do this on my own. I've got the strength. I've got the knowledge. We were victorious over there. Remember what I've told you during this building process that we're going, you know, we're trying to get a building built? I never want to hear one of us say, look what we did. I never want to hear that out of any of us. When that building is built, never want to hear one of us say, look what we did. What we are to say, and rightfully say, look what God did. Look at the, the victory that God has won. Not look what we did. We are His instruments. We are His tools. We are His vessels. We serve Him, and He is the one is to receive all the honor and glory. And we must seek His will in every battle. We must seek His guidance in every decision that we make. And especially, we have to understand that we're not going to get His guidance if we have unconfessed sin. And one of the things that we find here is that they started to get a little pride in them. Because I believe, you know, they had been victorious. And think about Jericho. How many times have you seen walls fall down? And, and being able to fully annihilate these people. All their, their you know, their battles, uh, the battle that was there in front of them. And so what we find here is that when we lose sight of that, and especially of giving God praise, we're going to leave God out. And then the people that come to, Jer or to Joshua and said, we can take AI. We don't need very, very many people. And what did Joshua do? Now Joshua was a man that was a, that was a man that was praying, a man that was seeking the Lord's guidance and will. But in I don't know what happened. He got persuaded. He got persuaded and saying, and he's probably listening to those that that are there working with him. And you know, Joshua, we don't. In fact, what does it say? It says that we don't need to uh, we don't need to put all of our people to labor. Look at verse three. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go out or go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people labor thither, for they are but few. So what we find here is that there's no consulting God in all of this. None. They just come off 
praising God, but now they forgot God. And I will tell you, that is exactly what happens to we as children of God at times. We'll have a victory, and we'll take claim for it. I had that victory. No, you didn't. God had the victory. He's the one that brought you through it. He's the one that showed you the way. He's the one that gave you the answers. That's why we find in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it says, Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face continually. Jeremiah writes this in Jeremiah 29, starting verse 12. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. Now let's turn that around. You know, I like to sometimes, that's the positive side. I sometimes like to give you the negative side. So let's read it backwards, all right? Not like spinning a record backwards, but I'll just read it backwards, okay? Where it says this, If you do not call on me, and if you do not pray unto me, I will not hearken unto you. If you do not seek me, you're not going to find me. And if you're not going to search for me with all your heart, then you're going to be like, you're not going to find me. So I just read it negatively. But it's the same thing. If we don't do these things, he's not there. But when we do the things that he says from his, from his word, he says, I will be found. But it also re requires us this, as the psalmist wrote in Psalms 139, starting in verse 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the, ever, the way everlasting. So what does this tell us? Is that if we're going to seek the Lord's guidance, if we're going to seek his will, then you and I, individually and collectively as a congregation, we need to seek his will and ask, or seek his guidance and ask this. Is there any sin that is standing in our way that is not going to give us victory in going forward? Every one of us need to ask that question. Is there any sin? Is there any sin that I have not confessed? Is there any sin that I've held up? Again, individually, meaning I've held it in my heart. I haven't lifted and said, Lord, I, I've confessed my sins. I realize that I've sinned against you. And, but you have said that you're faithful and just to forgive me from all my sins, all my unrighteousness. And you will do what? Cleanse me from those sins. When was the last time that we started out in battle, in a battle that we're dealing with, and that's the first thing we did? Lord, take care of my sin issue, and then we know we can take care of the battle issue. You see, we often just want to jump into the battle without dealing with the sin that's before us. And so we, we need to start out, but then we also need to seek his face continually. And I will tell you, sometimes we look at how, and you can all attest to this, especially if you've got any years on you, is that sometimes we look at a battle and say, oh, that's, that's not, there's no difficulty here. We can deal with that. And you've come to find out it's the worst thing you ever got yourself into. You know? That's Brother David just what it is about trying to work with an insurance company, right? You can think something, I can call him up and say, oh, I can deal with this here. And all of a sudden you find out is that it's like a behemoth sometimes working on the other side of that phone. Amen? And just as one example. But we start out with the Lord and asking, Lord, I need your help in this. I don't understand everything. You know, and going through this whole building project, you remember what I've told you all along in this journey. Every time I get done talking to a contractor or someone that, I, that we're interviewing or something, I always ask this one question. What should I have asked you that I didn't? What should I have asked you? Do not think that I know everything. Because actually, if you look at what I know, it's probably that, about that big, okay? I have to ask so I know. So that they understand that they can get on our side and realize, hey, this pastor in this church needs some help because they need to know. You see, when we understand we need the Lord's help and he works through people to help us, then we can see his hand working in all this. So what was, what was the issue? Well, we find here that what had happened, he had taken of the Babylonian gar garments. If you read through chapter 7, you will find that what he had done was that, look at verse 6. Well, actually, let's, let's back up uh, here. They lost the battle. But I want you to see what happened before I get to Achan, back to him. Joshua, though, in the defeat of losing 36 men, blames God. They just had a victory with Jericho, and he really blames God. Look what it says in verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes, because now he's got the message that came back that we lost 36 men. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou 
and all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Now think about that statement. But aren't we the same way? When something, we get a little bump in the road on a battle we're going through and we don't know what to deal with it and we, and we start blaming God over it. God, why didn't this go smoothly? Because I will tell you, sometimes, you know, the potter, he's got to put a few cracks in us in order to do what? Mend us and make us better. Sometimes he's got to put a dimple in us. And why does he put that dimple in us? Because he's going to put a handle on us so we can be a more usable cup for his service. So he's blaming him. Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan? Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And, and what wilt thou do that under thy great name? What will that do? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. I like to put the tents on the way he said, Get up! Why are you lying in the dirt? Why are you lying? Why dost thou liest uh, thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. And they've also transgressed my covenant when I commanded them. For they have, uh, they have even taken the accursed thing and have also stolen. And notice that word. They have stolen and dissembled themselves. Uh, also, and they have put it among, even among their own stuff. So not only are you taken of the cursed thing, because they were told, you take of the accursed thing, you're going you're gonna to be, you're going to die. And then what were they told? Is that they've stolen. What did they do? This individual, or individuals, that the Lord is, is telling Joshua, they've stolen from me. They've stolen from God. He said, stolen? Yeah, didn't it say back in chapter uh, 6? But the silver and gold, verse 19, and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasure of the Lord. They stole from God. Boy, I tell you, that's a dangerous place to be in, stealing from God. And so we find here, Achan, if you go and read, he had taken some garments. And he had taken some garments and... and you know, it goes through and it, it talks about the, uh, they serve, bring all the families out. Okay, who did this thing? Tell me. Fess up. Do this thing. And you know, one of the things that I want you to tell you, tell you about this here is that this man Achan, he had an opportunity to confess. He really did. He had an opportunity to repent. He had an opportunity, but he chose not. He chose not to say anything until he was found out. And he was found out. We know that it says that in fact, you're in chapter 7, look at verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, uh-oh, there's that word, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So what did they do? Joshua sent messengers. Joshua ended up saying that you are accursed, and the only way to get rid of this curse is you're going to have to die. Not just you, but your whole family is going to have to die. And then what did they do? It says that they took him out, and they, he was stoned to death. And then look at verse 26 of chapter 7. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor until this day. You know what? This was the second set of rocks that were heaped up. The first set of rocks were what they did. They brought the 12 stones upon the, bold, the boulders that were put on the shoulders of the 12 tribes, one man from each tribe. They were told to bring it across and set it up as a memorial. What is that memorial for? Is that every time your children, your grandchildren, and their children come to ask, why are these stones heaped up? You remind them that God brought us out of Egypt. God brought us through the wilderness 40 years. God brought us across Jordan. And you remind them it was God that did all of this. Well, what was this pile of stones here going to do? Why, Mom, why, Dad, is that pile of stones over there? Because there was a man in our camp that took from the accursed thing, 
and he stole from God. And God said, until we take care of the sin in the camp, we cannot go forward. Remember what I said? Sometimes we lose battles as a church because we don't take care of the sin in the camp. Now, I'm not saying that if you do something immoral that we're going to take you out and stone you. I didn't say that. If God chooses to stone you, that's on him. But we have things that the Lord has told us in the New Testament how to deal with people that are immoral. Amen? It's a process. All right? You start, you go to them and you talk to them and you try to, you know, try to get them to walk away from that immorality and to come back to do the right things. But if they don't, the Lord says what? We are to set them outside the church. They look, they've lost their membership. And as a result, we've turned them over to God. We've turned them over to Satan. You do what you need to with them for the purpose of what? Not harming them, but seeing that they are out of, out of sorts with the Lord, that they will repent and come back and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. And will you receive me back? And you know what we're to do as a church? Receive them back. That's the biblical principle of turning them over to God. So in other words, and, and we, don't make, we don't make an example of them. We don't laugh at them. We don't te- treat them badly. We understand by them going out there, it can be just as much as God is stoning them with stones. And that's what happened with Achan. He was stoned. His family, all of his stuff was there. Why is that pile laid up there? Don't steal from God because that could be you. Don't take them in a cursed thing because that could be you. That's what that second memorial was given in their early days of going across the River Jordan. So now they come back to the Lord. They've atoned for their sin. One man caused the whole, sin, the whole camp to sin. One man brought sin upon them. Now, chapter 8 says this, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. Now, now we're not taking two or three thousand. We have 30,000 men we'll see here. 30,000 we're going to take up, and I'll tell you what to do. And thou shalt go, or shalt do to Ai and her king, as thou didst unto Jericho and her king, only the spoil thereof. Now notice what happened, what he says. Only the spoil thereof, and the cattle thereof, shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. So what do we have? We have all the strategy that's going to be needed coming from God. Not from man, but from God. And notice also, as I pointed out earlier, notice he says, you can take the spoil. This time, you can take the spoil because why? The Lord got the first fruits, and now he says, this is what you can have. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 men, mighty men of valor, and sent them away by night. So he's going with them, 30,000. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not very far from the, um, from the city, but you shall be, all be ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass, when they come up or out against us, as at the first, that you will flee before them. Now what were they setting up? This is a very strategic thing. You want to draw them out of the city. And what better way is that you send a portion of your men, your, your uh, the army, because they've already seen you run once. So you send them out there, and they'll, they'll come out and they start chasing you. All right, that's what's going on. They will start chasing you, but we're not done yet. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say they flee before us as at the first. Therefore, we will flee before them. Then ye shall rise up from the ambush. So now he's got some people, some warriors behind them. He'll rise up and they will seize upon the city for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it shall be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord shall you do. See, I have commanded you. So notice here what was, what was the difference. Here, Joshua and the people were listening to God. They had the same battle in front of them. Remember, we got two battles in Ai. The first one they lost. They tucked tail and ran. They lost 36 men. But now we have a whole different strategy. We have God as our leader. Not some man, but God. And as a result of that, as a result, he says, I want you to set up an ambush. And as you continue reading, you will find that he left 5,000 men that were in the, still in the uh, uh, you know, in head so that when all of these soldiers came out 
And they started coming after, they started coming after uh, the Israelites, is that, and they thought they were going to have victory again, these men of Ahai, is that then what was going to happen? Because verse 12 tells us he took about 5,000 men, set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And then it says that uh, one dropped under 14 and it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it that they hasted. They rose up early and the men of the city went out against the Israel to battle. He and all the people at the time appointed. And then it says in Joshua verse 15, and Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of not a shot had been fired. Not an arrow had been thrown or shot. Not a spear had been thrown. And they're running, right? And says they pursued after them. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went not. Now notice here. Bethel now is also included this in this. First it was just Ai. Now Bethel is there. They went not out after Israel. And they left the city and pursued. And the Lord said to Joshua, Now, now that you've got them all out, Stretch out the spirit that's in thy hand toward Ai. Stick it up high. That was the, that was what was going to, it's like putting a flag up. Put the spear up high that they may see it. Well, who may see it? The men that are back, ready to do the ambush, come from back. And as a result, he stretched it up. And you know what the men of Israel did that were fleeing? They stopped and turned around. But they didn't turn around right away. They were still running away. Because if you read it, what happened was, and I'm just giving you the summary of this, is that they, the men, the 5,000 that went into the city, they started burning everything up. Now the men of Ai and Bethel, they start to look back and they see this smoke coming from their homes and from their town. Now what are they going to do? Well, what ended up happening is that the people of Ai, or I should say the, the soldiers that, of Israel, they did what? They came now and joined. The men of Israel that were out on the outside, they came and they surrounded the men of Ai and Bethel. And they were killing every one of them. In fact, they ended up killing like 12,000 people that day. But you see, it was God that gave them the victory. You say, well, how can that, that sounds so cruel, and why would God do this? Because God says to Abraham, this is the land I've given you. And I want you to take it. And what was, and, and the thing is that, well, didn't these people have any opportunity to know about God? Yes, they did. Because you see, God has been around since the creation of man. If you look back at Noah as an example, if you look back at Noah when Noah was on the scene, what ended up happening with Noah? It says, and every man did that which was right in his own sight. Every man did that which is right in his own sight. Every imagination of evil they were doing. And God says it repented him. Now I will tell you, they had heard the word of God. When you go and you look at there was Adam. There was, uh, then after Adam, his son, there was not Cain, but Seth. And then you move on to the next generation. There were about five or six different men that got all the way to Noah that lived a, a period of time across 1,500 or better years that they all knew what God did. What Adam did, they all knew what had gone on. It had been passed down word of mouth. Everybody knew. So they had had an opportunity to trust in God. They had had an opportunity when the Lord says, I'm going to destroy this earth with a flood. They had had an opportunity to get on that boat, that ark that Noah was making. They refused. And you see that door that was left open, and it says that that door was left open, that Noah and his family, there were eight of them that got on the ark. All the animals at least had enough sense that, that were going on that ark. They got on the ark. That door was left open. Does anybody else want to come on this ark? That door, that long suffering of God was left there. Will you come on this ark? Will you come to safety? Because that ark represented salvation. They, it represented that, and the door was left open. And then it says, and God closed the door. It wasn't Noah. It was God closed the door. And then everything that they had looked at, they started doing what? It's not going to rain. Come on, Noah. It was laughing at him, laughing at him. Noah, where's your rain? Where's your flood you've been talking about? And it went on, and they were, until all of a sudden, it started 
to rain. Until it started to pour, until the water started coming up, I've got to believe if you and I were able to see the ark today, that there were probably finger marks on the side of people trying to claw their way in to try to get into the ark, trying to get up to where they could reach up. There were no ladders available. They couldn't climb up to the top to get in. And then we know that man was destroyed. Except for Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, eight people. And the Lord said, replenish the earth. Replenish. But you see that replenishing was, and you remind people of what I have done. You remind people. And by the way, I'll remind people as well. And he says, every time you see that bow, it's called a rainbow in the sky, you'll be reminded. Remember that mountain over here of rocks? You remember that mountain of rocks over here? When they ask, what does that represent? That represents God bringing us out. That represents uh, what happens if we have sin and we, we don't walk away from it and we don't follow God and we steal from God. You remember what those, he says, every time you look and you see that rainbow across the sky, you will be have a memorial that first of all, I will never flood the whole earth again. It doesn't mean there won't be floods, but I'll never flood the whole earth again. That is my promise. That is my token promise unto you. Every time you see it, and by the way, only God could put that up. And he puts it up. He shows us. He reminds us. And I will tell you, that rainbow has been seen worldwide. When was the last time anybody asked, why do we have that rainbow up there? We look and say, oh, that looks so pretty. Why is that rainbow up there? It is a reminder of what God has done. And I will tell you this, is that all these people had an opportunity to hear about the Word of God and what God has done today you have an opportunity to hear about what God has done. Because you see, you have to understand this. is that door of salvation was opened, as I mentioned, to, to all those people in the days of Noah. But it is open today because the Lord tells us in His Word. He says, for all have sinned. All have come short of the glory of God. There's not one of us are righteous. Not one of us. You think you're going to get to heaven on your own? And you got enough, you're, you're bewildered. You're disillusioned if you think you're going to get to heaven on your own. But Jesus says in his word, but God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Jesus died so that we might have salvation. And you see, the door of salvation is open to everyone. Everyone. You say, well, do we have a monument today? Yes, we do. It's called the word of God. And every time we look at it, every time we read it, we understand who we are. First of all, if you're not saved, you need to be saved. It tells us that. But if you are saved, it tells us how to live for the Lord. How that every battle that we deal with, we need to go to the Lord. You know, I look at the battle of Ai, and again, there were two battles. They lost the first one because they didn't go to the Lord. What shows us that when we go to the Lord, we'll win every battle because He has given us the victory. You realize you study all that text that we looked at today? I, I just gave you a summary of much of it. He told them even about Jericho. I have given Jericho in thy hand. When we have a battle and we're serving the Lord, as he would say, as he would have us to by his word, he says, I have given you the battle. Now just go forward and take it. Take it. But how many of us get so timid that all we see is what's in front of us without realizing, and I used this word at the beginning, an overwatch, that he's watching over us. And he knows exactly what's in front of us. And he will tell us, no, go that way, go this way. But go forward. Don't worry about what's in front of you, because I will give you the victory. What did he tell his church? He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you, because why? I am with you all the way. I don't know where you are in your life. First of all, as an individual, are you a child of God? If you're not, if you're not a child of God, the only way to get to heaven is to come through Jesus. The Lord says, for by grace are you saved through faith. If that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. But as a child of God, we like to quote, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. But when was the last time you really saw him with his strength? You'll never win a battle 
if you could say really what you're saying, I can do all things through my own strength. And how many of us have lost the battle because of that? Instead of him giving us the strength. If there's sin in our lives, let's take care of it. Let's get it out. And then we can be victorious. Follow the teachings of the Lord. Let us stand as our musicians come for a hymn of invitation this morning. Father in heaven, as we come to the close of this study, we just thank you so much for what you've taught us and what your word has shown us. And Lord, you've shown us how to be victorious in our lives unto you, but you've also showed us how to be defeated in our lives because we didn't turn to you. Lord, you know the needs of each heart here, and especially, again, I pray that that door of salvation is open to everyone that will walk through it. But you've said that there will be one day that you're going to close that door. That individual can never be saved because they decided in their own heart, I will not trust in you as Savior. Lord, I pray that that has not happened yet, but that door is still open to those, to those individuals who have not trusted in you. But for we who are saved, Lord, I pray that our hearts are turned to you for leadership and guidance. For it is in the name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Hymn number 392, please. 392. <laughs> service this morning. Let's not forget our afternoon service at uh, 3 o'clock we're growing. Appreciate that today. Hebrews. Out of Hebrews. So I encourage you to be there for that. Wednesday night we're at 7 o'clock. We're still, uh, we've got a couple more lessons in our study of uh, the tabernacle and that's been a fabulous study and uh, we've been learning quite a bit in that study. Especially how to connect the Old Testament with the New Testament about Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to be there at 7 at Wednesday night. It's been a great day so far. Amen. Lord's Day. It's been a pleasure having my family with us here today. I must my dad for us if he would to lead us in closing prayer. Father God,